Good morning, Amy. Earlier this week, I'd be underwater. Much of lower Manhattan was. It is dry. The storm has passed. It's easy to say it's behind us. It's not. Make no mistake. It's just a matter of time before another storm hits. Here's one of the problems an aging infrastructure. Look at the seawall. This is from a bygone error, much like Lady Liberty out there in the harbor. Experts say there is a way to prevent this. They say it's time to spend billions to save billions. Experts now wonder if the massive storm surge that flooded lower Manhattan and washed away parts of the Jersey Shore could have been solved by sea barriers. Some scientists say Staten Island originally started as a natural barrier island, but the construction of roads, parking lots and homes created an urban landscape taking away this natural shield. Now two European engineering firms are proposing massive shields like these walls at the head of New York Harbor. Flood protections that were once considered unnecessary are now being reconsidered after Sandy's 14-foot surge. Anyone who says uh, there's not a dramatic change in weather patterns, I think is denying reality. Oceanography and professor Malcolm Bowman told us by phone a redesign is critical. If we had implemented these barriers by now, there would have been no damage to New York City from the ocean. The barriers are high tech. In one design, a wall lays flat on the bottom of the harbor, pivoting up when needed to block a storm surge. And they've proven effective in other major coastal regions like London and the Netherlands, operating 24 hours a day. But one proposal for New York's harbor runs upwards of $6 billion, and skeptics say the massive barriers may not work on long stretches of coastline like the Jersey Shore. When you have an enormous harbor like we do in Long Island Sound, it, 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 even if you spent a fortune, it's not clear to me that you would get much value for it. But with damage estimates for the storm reaching 20 billion, many are now saying it's time to consider new ideas. And only adding to the problem, barrier islands like Staten Island, not too far out there. It doesn't act like a natural barrier island soaking up water like a sponge because it's paved over. It's devastated this morning. And this debate about super science and spending money now to save money later will only continue. Back to you, George. Boy, it sure will, John. The ABC's John Muller is here with the latest. Good morning, John. Good morning, George. The mystified pilot described seeing a small black drone with helicopter rotors strangely close to his plane. Who it belongs to runs the range from hobbyists to potential terrorists. This morning, the preliminary investigation includes the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Listen to this cockpit audio recording as a pilot on an Alitalia flight literally can't believe what he's seeing. So what did you say? Uh, we saw a drone, a drone aircraft. The Alitalia flight was on its final approach to JFK International Airport Monday afternoon when the pilot saw the unidentified object. Alitalia, uh, what else did you see that aircraft? Uh, about 1,500. The pilot did not take evasive action and the flight landed safely. Air traffic control shared their information with other incoming flights. Report of a drone aircraft, five mile final, 1,500 feet. Use caution, runway 318, clear to land. Clear to land, we'll look at the drone, we're slowing to 180 knots, JetBlue 906. Drones are small, unmanned, remote controlled flying objects. Their non military use is increasing as new technology makes them applicable for reconnaissance and surveillance. The FAA is investigating the incident. Of course, even if the drone belongs to a hobbyist, that doesn't make it any less dangerous to an aircraft that it collides with. Now, experts say drones will eventually become a day to day part of life used in weather and traffic reports, even for finding lost dogs and cats. But they certainly can't be flying this close to commercial jets. George. Boy, that is the point. Amazing it got that close. Thanks, John. Good morning, Elizabeth. And they still are long. Take a look. They stretch for blocks. They are long. They are intense. We haven't seen anything like this since the 1970s. Rationing in place. Here's how it works. If you have an odd numbered plate, it ends in an odd number. You can fill up on an odd numbered date. If you have an even numbered plate, you can fill up on an even numbered date. Lots of police officers here. They're doing a bunch of things. They're directing traffic. They're keeping the peace. There are some hot tempers out here. And they're making sure that today is the right day to fill up. This morning, day 11 of impossibly long lines and impossibly scarce gasoline. Ratcheting is now spread to New York City and Long Island. A mass of humanity starving for fuel with an increasingly short fuse. It's impossible. There, there, there is no gas or um, you wait three hours. Many are running out before they even reach the pump. Last night, a New York City cop there to keep a tense peace helps a man push his car the final block to the promised land. 
But north of New York City, an Orange County man charged with running down a police officer after he was told to move his car from a gas line blocking traffic. Keep in mind, it's not just fuel for cars. This morning, more than 500,000 customers across the region are still living without power, and many need the gas to keep generators running in frigid temperatures. It's bad and it's cold. And now we have no walls, we have no insulation, we have no floor. You know, it's cold. Ten days after the killer storm, Mayor Bloomberg finally taking action, putting in gas rationing by license plates. We have to do something, and this is something that is practical and enforceable. This week's Nor'easter just adding to the problems with additional power outages and tanker deliveries disrupted. There's no real gas in Brooklyn. Yeah. We came in to Manhattan to get gas. Wow. And an hour and a half, you say? No, two hours. The rationing shortages and long lines expected to last at least a couple of more weeks. Here we go. All right, a very welcoming sign here in Manhattan. A tanker truck actually filling the gas station up with gas. We need more of these. This is expected to last for at least another couple of weeks. The rationing in New Jersey worked very well there. And New York City and Long Island are hoping for some similar results. George, we'll send it back to you. Thank you, John. Good morning, Robin. Today's the day. It's either the end of a six-year legal nightmare for Amanda Knox, or it is back to step one, a retrial. All eyes on the Italian Supreme Court. This morning inside the Italian Supreme Court, prosecutors are making the case that Amanda Knox and Raffaele Selecito should never have been acquitted in the 2007 murder of British student Meredith Kircher. And they're arguing for a retrial. Immediately released. <laughs> After Knox and her former Italian boyfriend were released 18 months ago, yeah. prosecutors appealed the lower court's decision, citing contradictions in the ruling. Kircher's family supports the appeal, telling Italian media, there's still unanswered questions. We are searching for the truth. But in a statement to ABC News, the Knox family says this morning's hearing is simply another example of harassment by the prosecution. We are hopeful and prayerful that they will render a verdict which will simply say that the appellate court acted properly. The worst hearing outcome for Knox would be a retrial and another agonizing wait for it to all end. Knox's legal team feels that's not likely. That appellate court jury determined the evidence to be absent, non-existent, inaccurate, unreliable, and simply wrong. A verdict the Italian Supreme Court now has to evaluate. In Seattle, Knox is back in class at the University of Washington. She spends free time with her boyfriend, James Toronto, her three sisters, or playing the guitar. Knox dedicated this past year to writing her upcoming memoir, Waiting to be Heard. All right, so in the unlikely event an acquittal is overturned, it would set off a complicated set of legal maneuvers towards extradition, but that could take years and would be very tricky. Amanda Knox would most likely never set foot on Italian soil again. George? Maybe it's John Muller is here with more. Good morning, John. Good morning, George. The disturbing video set off an avalanche of criticism. A New Jersey State Assemblyman demanding Coach Mike Rice be fired immediately. Governor Chris Christie wants answers from Rutgers University. Even NBA great LeBron James is furious. Take a look. Take a look at this shocking video making headlines this morning. Watches Rutgers University men's basketball coach Mike Rice is captured on tape screaming obscenities. <laughs> Homophobic slurs. <laughs> even hurling basketballs at players' heads at point blank range during several practices during Rice's first three years as coach. To see your coach physically putting his hands on players, physically kicking players. The video clips were compiled by retired NBA player Eric Murdoch after he was fired from the team as the director of player development. Murdoch says Rice's extreme coaching antics caused at least three players to transfer from the university. That's how it was. The verbal abuse, the belittling. Yeah, I was like in total shock that this guy wasn't fired immediately on the spot. Rutgers Athletic Director Tim Pernetti tells ESPN Tuesday night that there were signs and prior complaints about Rice's behavior in the past. There were incidents with language uh, that concerned me early on. Pernetti was shown hours of video of Rice verbally and physically abusing his team during practice last November. He suspended Rice for three games, fined him $50,000, and ordered mandatory anger management classes. This morning, Pernetti is reportedly reconsidering his decision not to fire the coach. 
We did reach out to Coach Rice for comment. We also reached out to Rutgers University. We have not received any response from the coach or the school. You get the feeling that this one has some legs, guys. Yeah, you can't believe that's the last we're going to hear from them. That's an yeah. out, it's an outrageous video. I mean, I think about the parents. If that's your child and you see that coach doing that to your child. The coach is violating a sacred trust, uh, yeah. and, and that, that can't be tolerated at all. That's, that's, that's horrifying. It horrifying. kind of makes the Bobby Knight video we saw years ago look tame. I mean, that's how bad it is. And he only lasted six months after that. And now to the political brawl going on between Hillary Clinton's camp and Republican strategist Karl Rove. It stems from comments Rove has made about Clinton's health, which are being answered aggressively. But she this all started on Monday when Rove reportedly in told a conference that Clinton today. has, quote, brain damage and that if she runs for president, voters have a right to know what happened when she suffered a fall in December 2012. Rove seems to be walking those comments back, but he's maintaining the crux of his statement to the Washington Post, saying, This is a serious health episode. She would not be human if it didn't enter into her calculations. Clinton's camp is pushing back. Her spokesman saying of Rove and the GOP, they are scared of what she has achieved and what she has to offer. Even President Obama's spokesman came to Clinton's defense, mockingly pointing out that Rove has been wrong in the past. Dr. Rove uh, might have been the last person in America on election night uh, to recognize and acknowledge that the president had been won re-election, including the state of Ohio. So we'll leave it at that. As for that December 2012 incident, we know that Hillary Clinton was at home recovering from a stomach bug when she fainted, fell, and suffered a concussion. During a follow-up exam, doctors discovered a blood clot in a vein behind her right ear. She was treated with blood thinners during a brief hospital stay. Now, of course, Clinton hasn't even said whether she's going to run for president. She's preparing for a book tour next month. It doesn't get much stranger than jumping from a monorail at the zoo into the tiger pen, but this one just gets weirder and weirder. As you mentioned, police asked this 25-year-old fighting for his life why he did it, and he said, quote, I wanted to be one with the tiger. Just as strange, police have no reason to think he was intoxicated, and they don't think he's mentally ill. It shocked everyone, an unthinkable jump off this Bronx Zoo monorail, 17 feet down, right into the tiger pen. No, it was not a suicide attempt. Police say 25-year-old David Villalobos did it on purpose so he could be one with a 400-pound male Siberian tiger, a tiger much like this one, the largest big cat in the world, capable of killing a man in a matter of seconds. This is New York. We have 8.4 million people here. and. Uh, you know, strange things can sometimes uh, happen. The new details are startling. Villa Lobos told police he landed on all fours, like a cat. On his Facebook page, pictures of his obsession, a Siberian tiger, like the one that dragged him around the pen, crushing his ankle and biting his body. You know, on his Facebook page, he has a picture of a tiger. So apparently he has some fascination with, with tigers. And to say he visited the zoo in the last month. Indeed, a former classmate confirmed his odd behavior of late. Recently, I saw some of the stuff he wrote on Facebook, and uh, it just seemed a little strange. It turns out Villa Lobos sustained most of his serious injuries from the fall rather than the tiger, breaking his shoulder, pelvis, and a rib, also collapsing a lung on impact. Villa Lobos did succeed in becoming one with the tiger while in his jaws for almost 10 minutes, but zoo officials say the tiger didn't want him dead or he would have been. Uh, he was uh, rescued by zoo personnel who used a fire extinguisher to distract the, the tiger. They instructed him to roll over by an electrified fence. They told told him to be able to roll under the, uh, the fence. Villa Lobos also told police, quote, everyone in life makes choices. This choice nearly killed him. Villa Lobos remains in stable condition at the hospital. He faces criminal trespassing charges, and if he's convicted before long, he could be one with a jail cell. Now, he actually told police after this initial mauling, he did have a chance to pet the tiger, and he has vivid memories of this. The tiger, by the way, will not be euthanized. The official says the tiger did nothing wrong. Dan, back to you. ABC's John Muller tells us what happened next. How can I help you? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm, you know, Sheriff and Brandon. It sounded like a chilling ordeal. 31-year-old Dwayne Yeager calling 911 just after 7 a.m. Monday morning to report that his home had been broken into and ransacked while he was out for just 45 minutes. I come back, uh, my door's wide open, my windows uh, to my son's bedroom wide open, my TV's are laying on the ground. The problem? Police say it all turned out to be an elaborate Ferris Bueller-style ruse.
I'm taking the day off. Now get dressed and come on over. Allegedly perpetrated by Jaeger himself to get out of work. And there appears to be proof. Police say this surveillance video from a neighbor's home shows Jaeger pulling up to his own home. A few moments later, that open window he told 911 about opens. Shortly after that, Jaeger reemerges moments before placing that 911 call. I called y'all right away. When questioned further, police say Jaeger admitted he staged the whole thing because of a bad case of the Monday morning blues. He confessed that this case was done because he didn't want to go to work. His wife was adamant about going and he just simply didn't want to go. Jaeger now charged with a first degree misdemeanor for providing false information to law enforcement, which if he's convicted could result in a fine and even up to a year in jail. Now, ironically, Jaeger works as a fabricator, and what a fabrication he is now charged with. Can you believe that? He is free this morning after paying $500 bail, but the man who didn't want to face his wife will soon face a judge. And he still has to face his wife. <laughs> <laughs> that, too. Double whammy. Uh, what about, like, uh, the cat ate my homework? It was so much simpler. A migraine, yeah. bad anchovies on your pizza, you know. Anything well, you that. know. Thanks, John.